Uh, we are halfway through the series on what your family needs now, where the goal is to help you build a family that loves spending time together and walks through life side by side. In order to make this a reality, we have been focusing on how to grow in the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. For those of you who are new to this series, that last sentence might be very weird, but it basically means that the fruit of the Spirit is not a law to you. It's not something that you work harder to acquire. The fruit of the Spirit is a description of your personality when you're deeply connected to Jesus as the root of your life, right? This, these are the kind of qualities that will show up in your life. Now, this morning, I want to talk to you guys about faithfulness, faithfulness. I highlighted the wrong thing. I'm sorry. Today we're, talking about, today we're talking about faithfulness, not kindness. Now, what does faithfulness look like in a family? What does faithfulness look like in a family? Um, some people might see faithfulness in a family as just tolerating the dark side of your family members. You know, like your brother might be super annoying. Like your, your dad is probably, you know, gambling with debts outside. And faithfulness means you don't air your dirty laundry in public, right? Or when, when um, your, your sister sk- skips schools and then your, the teacher calls home, you pick up the phone before your mom does and tell her, no, 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 no. My sister is right there in school. It's your fault. You should find her, right? That is not what faithfulness is all about. It's not about having the back of your family members who are making mistakes because those are actually quite service level and totally not good for your family in the long term. Instead, faithfulness is a commitment that you will grow in your love for each other over a long period of time. It's a commitment to grow in your love for each other over a long period of time. It's a commitment that you will care for each other's well-being. And when conflict inevitably arises in your family, faithfulness is a commitment that you will engage them with love, patience, kindness, and all the fruits of the spirits, and not just to shut down and walk away. Right? Staying together because you have to, but then in reality, you're shutting down and walking away from your family member. That is not faithfulness. Faithfulness is when you engage with love, patience, and kindness. You actually see this in a marriage vow, in the marriage vow. So for those of you who are married, right, or if you have been to a wedding before, do you remember what you promise each other on your wedding day? It probably goes something like this. From this day forward, I promise to love and cherish you, right, for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us apart. This is a wonderful promise that we make to each other, and it's not just between the spouses. Faithfulness is the foundation for all healthy relationships in a family, right? That's essentially the same vow parents and children make to each other and siblings make to each other. But then somewhere along the way, faithfulness becomes really hard because when you live together for long periods of time, you inevitably inflict pain on each other. So then you have resentments building up and faithfulness becomes really hard. People start to hurt each other really badly to the point where faithfulness really sounds like a pretty dumb option at that point. What do I mean? Back in the 80s and 90s, there's this guy. His name is Pastor Bill Wilson. He began a children ministry in, uh, in the ghetto of Brooklyn, New York. And every Sunday, he and the volunteers team that he recruited would drive these buses into the ghettos to pick up children to come to church. And these bus drivers are not just regular bus drivers. They're essentially pastors to the communities because besides picking up the children to take them to church, they also just visit the families in the assigned neighborhood where they are to t- share the gospel with them, help them read the Bible, pray with the family, see what they actually need, right? So during the week and also on the weekend, these these the, the, uh, these these are. Uh, Bus drivers are also pastors of the communities. And over the year, under Pastor Bill's leadership, this grew into the largest children ministry in America, reaching over 100,000 kids every week. It is, a, it is crazy. They have been on many secular like, TV shows just because of the success. Now, do you guys know like, what drove him to focus on children from broken families? He is so, like, he, he's such a, dynamic speaker, entrepreneurial, great leader, faithful man of God. He can, you know, be the next Hudson Taylor. He can grow a mega church, right? He can, he can write a book that impacts generation, but he did none of that 
or at least in the first 30, 40 years of his ministry, he chose to just stay in the ghettos of Brooklyn and focus on children from a broken family. And the reason is when he was 12 years old, one day his mother took him to a street corner. They sat together for a while in silence. And this teenage um, Bill did not know what was going on. He just sat there. A few months, few months later, the mom said to him, Bill, I'm sorry, but I can't do this anymore. Wait here, and I will be back. So then Bill waited at the street corner for the next three days, and mom never came back. <coughs> A Christian car mechanic in the neighborhood took him in. He fed the boy and then brought him to a youth, youth uh, gathering at church that evening. When Bill heard about Jesus, he instinctively wanted to give his life to Christ. But then because he looked and smelled like a homeless man, right, after just being on the streets and also just feeling so depressed and unwanted, the people at church did not want to go near him or even pray for him to help him receive Jesus. So by himself, he prayed to God and he says, God, my mom doesn't want me. These Christians clearly don't want me. But if you want me, then here I am. And as he prayed that prayer, the Lord took him in to his family and his life changed from that point. I tell you this story because some of you in this room also come from a very broken family, isn't it? Like some of you feel abandoned like Pastor Bill. Some of you feel abused by the people who are closest to you. Some of you feel betrayed by your family because maybe there has been an adultery in your family and you just feel betrayed. And no one wants to be unfaithful to our family. Like our default, our default is to want faithfulness in the family. But then sometimes we just feel like there's no other choice because the pain is simply too much. Now, before we proceed, I want to make it clear that I'm not advocating for victims of abuse to stay in an abusive relationship. <laughs> so if you're in danger, right, in the family, faithfulness doesn't mean suffering in silence and just let people walk all over you. You have to protect yourself, establish safe boundary, and then reach out for help. Now, if you don't know who you can talk to, I want to invite you to reach out to one of the pastoral staff in our church, right? We will pray with you. We will walk with you. We will help you find the help you need. We will be there for you. We will try our best to be there for you. But for the vast majority of us who are not in that situation, this is my challenge to you this week. As I said in Proverbs 3, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so that you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and men. And that's what I hope you focus on this week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being faithful to us. And as we respond in kind, in kind um, Lord, give us the strength to persevere in our broken home. I pray especially for those who have been deeply hurt by their family members. Lord, comfort them and be with them today so that they can go back and live out their faith in those closest relationships um, that they have in the family. So thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, when people read the Old Testament, it's very common that they walk away with two uh, major impressions of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Old, Old Testament. First, they see just how unfaithful the people of God is to God and to each other. Like, it's really, really bad. After all these things that God has done for them, how can the people of God be so ungrateful and unfaithful? It's horrendous. But then secondly, the second impression you will get when you read the Old Testament is that despite the unfaithfulness of the people, God remained faithful to them through right, the centuries. God turned his way, face away from them when they're unfaithful, allowed them to be captured, right? allowed them to be conquered. But then God continuously continued to be there for them, to call a remnant to his own name for his glory. God continued to change their hearts, right? to send prophets to them, to speak the word of God to them, so that when they repent of their sins, right, he will raise up an army, defeat their enemies, and bring the people of God back to the promised land. That is what you see in the Old Testament. And this is very crucial because when you want to be faithful to your family, you have to be faithful as a response to the faithful God. That has to be the motivation. You have to be faithful to your family as a response to a faithful God. Because if your faithfulness to your family depends on what your family do to you, like how they respond to you, 
then your family members will give you plenty of opportunities to reject them, right? To give up. So if your eyes are focused on what your family members do, then you will lose the motivations eventually. And you will fail to love and cherish them the way that you promise them, the way that God is calling you to. But if your eyes are focused on the faithful God, then you can be faithful to your family through the challenging times. So our eyes have to be on this faithful God. Now, what does that mean? How is God faithful? I want to tell you guys four things today about why God is faithful. First of all, God is faithful in justice, which means he will hold everyone accountable for their sins, for their wrongdoings, for their evil actions. As Deuteronomy chapter 32 reads to us, the rock, that's not the Hollywood actor, okay? This is, this is God, okay? The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness, without iniquity, he is just and upright. That means if anyone has wronged you in the family, they will be held accountable. The divine creator of the universe will punish them. And that is good news to us. That is good news to us. If someone in your family has hurt you, God promises justice for you. But at the same time, the justice of God is also a double-edged sword because just as God will judge those who hurt us, he will also judge us because we have hurt others. Right? There is none of, none of us can say that we have not hurt our family members before. And just as God will hold them accountable, he will hold us accountable. A lot of non-Christians I meet believe that they are good people because they're trying very hard to be good. And they believe deep down that even if they're not Christians, even if they're agnostic or atheist, if God is real and he stands before God, right, on judgment day, if God is truly good, truly just, then he will let me into heaven because I am a good person. That's what I find a lot of non-Christians think. But then I want us to just think about that for a second and think about whether that is true. We've been talking about the fruit of the spirits over the past several weeks. So why don't we just use that as the standards of who goes to heaven and hell? I mean, how faithful are you to your family when they give you no reason to? If God just judges you based on that, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? Two weeks ago, we talked about kindness. How kind are you to your family? Right? <clears throat> are you kinder to your parents the way that you're kind to your best friends? Probably not. And why not? You will be judged for that one day. How patient are you with your family? Now, you might be thinking, come on, Ronnie, this is going overboard. Because are you really saying that my impatience with my annoying brothers is the same thing as murderers and rapists who are going to hell? Like, are you really equating the two? And of course, I'm not equating these two. I'm not saying these two are equal, right? There is no excuse for murderers and rapists. They will suffer eternal damnation. But the question I want to ask you is, why is the standard so low? Why is the standard for going to heaven just, you know, don't be a rapist and a murderer? Do you ever walk around encouraging yourself, hey, I'm a good person, I'm not going to be a rapist and murderer? Like, nobody set the standard that low for ourselves. So why do you expect God to set the standards that low? God's standard is way higher than your standards. Your standard is way higher than just murderers and rapists, and God's standard will be even higher than that. And it's because of that, the Bible says that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. It's not just that we are not perfect. It's that we are so far from perfect. If you dare to stand before God on judgment day and says, I have tried my best, you will feel so ashamed of what you just said. You are so far from being good, from being perfect. Now, many of my friends, both inside and outside of church, sometimes even Christians fall into this. They think that I'm very busy right now. I don't have time to think about this God, eternity, heaven, hell, faith, Christianity. I don't have time to think about this. I'm too busy. 
So they carry on with their life without really thinking about this. Now, you can, of course, do that if you want. That's, you know, your, your freedom. But I will fail at my job as a pastor if I don't give you this warning. My friends, you can push death aside, but death will not push you aside. Does that make sense? You can, put, you can push death aside if you want, but death will not push you aside. With every day that passes, you are one day closer to death, one day closer to judgment day, one day closer to having to answer before God the sins that you have committed. Have you guys heard of those stories where a doctor says, you know, you have terminal cancer, can't be treated, you got six months to live, right? Maybe you, your family or friends has been through that ordeal before. We often feel very sorry for them, right? It's a tragedy that they only get six months to live. But be that as it may, if you look at it from another perspective, you can also feel that it's kind of lucky that this person has a six-month warning, knowing that in six months he will face his creator. Because the truth is, for most of us in this room, you will probably not get a six-month warning that you're going to die. It will just be like that. So I urge you, don't pack your life with busyness until you can make sense of death. Your chemistry homework, making money, going on vacations, even raising your family, as noble as that is, and that's taking up all your time. If you don't know what happens when you die, if you cannot make sense of death, make that the first priority in your life before you pack your life with busyness. And if you do, if you do this, you'll find that God is also faithful in salvation. First Corinthians chapter one says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The faithfulness of God is displayed by calling people who don't deserve it to come into a fellowship with his son. So even though all of us are heading for eternal damnation for our sins, the Bible says that God provides a way for us to be saved because Jesus wants you and I to be part of his family. And that's why he, being the son of God, truly God himself, died on the cross as a reparation for all the harm that you have brought into this world. Yes, some may have brought more harm than you, but don't look at other people, look at yourself. Jesus Christ has died as a reparation for all the harm that you have brought into this world. But anyone who confesses your sins, turn your lives around, trust in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross as being enough. Anyone who makes a commitment to apprentice under Jesus Christ for the rest of your life will be welcomed into God's eternal family. And that is the good news. And my friends, if you don't know today Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you grew up in church or not, if that is just not a deep conviction of your heart, then don't leave this church until you talk to a Christian about it today, until you talk to me up here after the service today. Don't leave the church this morning without accepting the faithfulness of God in your salvation. Number three, God is faithful in your suffering. I don't have time, so I'm not going to go into this. I'm just going to read you two Bible verses and move on. Psalm 91 chapter, uh, verse 4 says, He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wing you will find refuge, because his faithfulness is a shield to you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, The Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. That is the faithfulness of God. Lastly and crucially, God is faithful in producing faithfulness in you. Hear that again. God is faithful in producing faithfulness in you because this is a fascinating passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, therefore he will do it. Okay, very confusing, but to understand this passage, you need to know what sanctification means. Sanctification means you are becoming more and more like Jesus by growing in the fruit of the Spirit, 
right? So that whole thing, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, that whole thing is now your natural personality. That is what sanctification means. And the most interesting part of this passage is that it doesn't say that you will grow in them so that when you stand before Jesus, right, at the coming of the Lord, you will be like, I did a good job. That's not what it says. It says God himself will sanctify you because he's faithful. God will produce the fruit of the spirits, including faithfulness in you. So if you're struggling to be faithful in your family, come to God, put your gaze on the faithfulness of God and let him produce faithfulness in you. Now, how does he do this? God does this by leading you on a path of forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, this topic could easily be a sermon series. So I'm just, I will have to be brief here, right? Knowing that I opened up many potholes that I cannot, I cannot fix today. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetfulness. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetfulness. Forgiving someone doesn't mean that you give them another chance to hurt you again. It doesn't mean you make, your vulnerable, you make yourself vulnerable without defense, out of love and kindness, so that they can keep hurting you over and over. That is not forgiveness. You have to be strong and protect yourself and establish boundaries so that you don't get hurt. But at the same time, you have to make a decision that you will seek no retaliation and hold no grudges. You will seek no retaliation and hold no grudges. Pastor Tim Keller puts it this way, forgiveness is often granted before it is felt uh, inside. When you forgive somebody, you're not saying, look, my, all my anger is gone. I'm going to be best friend with you again. That's not what you're saying. What you're really saying is, I will treat you the way that God treated me. I know you are still a terrible person. I'm not going to come near you the way that I used to but I will seek no retaliation. I will hold no grudges against you. I will treat you fairly as someone made in the image of God. I will give you the rights that you deserve and not withhold anything that will be good for you. I follow an Asian Australian writer named Heidi Tai. She's a second generation immigrant a church planter, pastor's wife, and someone who came to faith as a young adult. So because her background is very similar to mine, I, when, when I read her writing, it often just deeply resonates with me. And this week, she wrote a short piece about her reconciliation to her father. She said that growing up in a traditional immigrant home in Australia, of course, she did not have a warm relationship with her dad. And then moreover, as an adult, she, you know, throughout high school, university, she partied, she drank, she was promiscuous, until one day, she stepped into a church, and the pastor spoke about Jesus and the adulterous woman from John chapter 8 that day. For those of you who don't know the story of Jesus and the adulterous woman from John 8, it's, let me quickly give you a two-minute version. Basically, the religious elites brought this adulterous woman to Jesus, she was caught in adultery, in the act of adultery. And according to Jewish law, someone like this is punishable by stoning. Okay? It's punishable by stoning. And they asked Jesus if they could go ahead with the execution. But Jesus' answer shocked everyone because he did not say, yeah, of course, stone her, execute her, because that's the law. You've got to follow the law, right? right? Which is what often you know, conservatives would say. You gotta follow the law. So if the law says stone her because she's adulterer, then stone her. Jesus didn't say that. But neither did Jesus say, come on guys, it's just sex before marriage. Can we just chill, it's not that serious. Which is what a lot of the liberals would say. Jesus did not say that either. Instead, he picked up a stone. He held it in front of these religious leaders. And then he says, here's a stone. Now, if any one of you has never sinned, come take it from me and be the first one to throw. And he just opened invitation like that. And the next several minutes shocked everyone because one after another, the religious elites walked away in shame. 
And when it is all over, Jesus said to the woman, hey, you're safe to go now. But listen to me. You must leave your life of sin. This is a life of sin. You have to leave it. But I will not stone you today. I will not stone you today because that stone will fall on me instead. When Heidi heard that story about Jesus, she thought to herself, I am that adulterous woman. That's me. And her mind was blown by what God did for her. So this is what she wrote, and I'm going to close our time together with what she wrote. She said, with great sorrow, I watched as Jesus was dragged into the public square to be insulted and humiliated. I watched as the innocent one who once silenced the wits of men remained silenced before false testimony. Pierced by thorns and nails, I watched as he who knew no sin shouldered the full penalty of humanity's sins on the Roman cross. And at the cross, neither mercy nor justice is compromised. It is against this backdrop of divine mercy that Jesus then exhorts his followers, go now and leave your life of sin. So then with my heart overflowing with awe and praise, I sober up to a life of love and self-control. At first, it was all natural and joyful until I heard God's calling to forgive and reconcile with my dad. But how can I? when I had spent so many years running away from the pain. My initial efforts to reconcile was dependent on brute strength, you know, like my religions of do better. But I failed over and over again with bitterness and resentment. I mean, that doesn't deserve it. Why do I have to be the bigger person? He needs to say sorry first. But in time, God showed me a better way, a power possible and perfected in human weakness. And it is there I found it in the Lord's Prayer, where it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So instead of demanding myself to do better, I began to admit my inability and to ask God for forgiveness. I lay bare my anger and resentment, my stubbornness and pride. I learned to pray daily for forgiveness so that the gospel of grace could take root in my heart. I wasn't expected to earn God's favor, so why am I now demanding my dad to earn mine? Humbled again by the truth of amazing grace, my heart began to soften with mercy and compassion. I began to see my dad in the same way that God saw me, a sinner in need of grace. And then here's what happened. So over breakfast on Saturdays, I began to show my dad my new faith and foundations. I listened to his stories. He opened up his heart to mine. The Spirit gifted us with wisdom, empathy, humility that we never had before. And soon, Dad and I reconcile at the foot of the cross, agreeing to move forward hand in hand, even if we couldn't always see eye to eye. I pray that this is your story over the next several years. If you're in a home that is very, very broken, My heart aches for the pain that you will go through as you try to be faithful. But remember, our faithful God promised you that at the foot of the cross, even if you can't see eye to eye, you can move forward hand in hand with your family. And as it said here, hold on to the promise that Jesus will produce faithfulness in you. And on, there will, and on that faithful day, when all is said and done, you will find yourself standing before the gates of heaven. Jesus will open the door. Instead of condemning you for all your sins, he will say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of your master. I pray that this will be true for your life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, Thank you for being a faithful God to us when we don't deserve it. Lord, I know many of us will have decades of battle to be faithful to our family. And one sermon may not change all that much, but I pray that your words today will comfort them and encourage them to keep going. And Lord, I pray that at the foot of the cross, transformation will happen in the family, God that amazing reconciliation will begin. Forgiveness will take place. 
Lord, we cannot do this ourselves. You will have to do this through us. So please come and be faithful to produce these faithfulness in us. In Jesus' name, amen.